subtle skills, big results. Welcome to the Ninja Selling Podcast. Welcome back, everybody, to the Ninja Selling Podcast. Garrett and Matt here, as always. And welcome to everybody who's new. If you're brand new to this podcast, welcome. If you're curious about what Ninja Selling is, just go to ninjaselling.com to learn more about it. But essentially, you're here to learn more about how to apply this user-friendly, incredible system into your lives and your business. And if you want to be a part of a community of people who are doing just that, all you have to do is head over to Facebook and search for The Ninja Selling Podcast there and you'll find our group. You can join over 11,000 people. It's a wonderful. Garrett, good morning to you, sir. Good morning. How are you today? I'm doing great, man. The sun's shining. Looks like the sun's actually already peeking up in your window there. Is that right? Am, am I seeing that reflection correctly or is that just an exterior light? That is a that is an interior light pointed just the right way to make it look like it's daytime, I guess. <laughs> there you go. Uh, All it's right. Doing a, doing a good job too. I look at my picture, I'm like, it doesn't look like the sun's coming up, but yeah. it rises from the other direction. So no way. I mean, I know we hit the time change coming up. Like we got like a month to the time change, which maybe at 6 30 you will have sun in there, but not yet. Seemed a little, but anyway, you know, hey, bending time is also a fun thing. But hey, Garrett, we got a fun topic today. I think this is, I think this will maybe spark some conversation inside brokerages. And this is a topic that's come out of some conversations that I've had with broker owners, managers, and also some agents. And this has to do with how offices are are designed and laid out and the the big challenge for brokerages has been how do we get agents back in the office after covid you know they've been working from home they figured out how to do that at a high level and and now we're struggling to get them back in the office and i had proposed to one person i was like is it that it's part of it for sure because there's massive time savings on the commuting thing but what else is going on in terms of how these offices are laid out and is there an opportunity for a brokerage to design something or restructure so that agents do come into the office. So it should be fun to talk about. I'm excited to talk about it because this has been something that's been going on for much longer than just COVID. A lot of people look at it like, oh, this is this is COVID yeah. making this like we've all went through this and this is what what happened here. And just for a second, Matt, do you mind if I go back on like a little bit of a timeline here of kind of like what I've watched and not at all, because I think it's important because you're right that it's it's let's stop using COVID as the excuse as to why people aren't coming into the office. Maybe that amplified what was going on, but this history I think is important. I think it just built upon something that's been kind of growing for a long time. So Larry and I have had many conversations about this and they started back in 2008. And what really back in 2008, if anybody remembers, that was right after the banks had failed And everybody was running in 10 different directions, trying to figure out how to make real estate work. Brokerages were running on very thin margins, trying to make sure they could keep their doors open, make sure the real estate company was going to continue as a thriving source moving forward. And a lot of brokerages basically said, we got this great idea. We're going to send everybody home. You can all work out of your house. Um, We're going to shut down the brick and mortar office. And we're going to make a little satellite office that basically uh, people can come by. You have a place where your managing broker is going to be. Overhead's going to drop tremendously. And you guys can run and do your business. Well, that model, and there's some companies right now that have pulled off that model, by the way. Like there, there's some successful companies that pulled it off. We didn't have the structure back then in 2008 when this was all happening that a lot of these successful ones have right now. <laughs> like I can, I can hear companies in my head going, that's our model right now. And I'm like, I know, you're good. You, you have figured it out on a very good level. But a lot of companies didn't have the structure or the business model to make that work. So what happened in 2008, 2009, 2010 is we saw companies send all the agents back to their office or to, gee, I can't talk to their homes. <laughs> you guys can work wherever you guys want to work. We're going to car if you want to Starbucks. I don't care. Just dude, we need to make sure business is happening. Well, the companies that held everybody in house and said, nope, we're going to keep this model. We're going to have a place that you can all show up to. You can all work in. It's going to get tight, but we're going to get through this. We're going to keep the camaraderie going. We're going to keep the energy going. Those guys actually did really well. They came out of it pretty clean. A lot of the companies that sent everybody home, what they did is they broke their tribe. 
they lost all the internal energy of that office. A lot of these people that, you know, they, they say they want to be business owners often on their own, doing their own thing. They really kind of need a little bit of that energy of an office and camaraderie of a group. They, a lot of them left the business because they just couldn't figure out how to keep motivation going and keep traction going. They kind of rode off into the sunset. And then coming out of that time, what we found is a lot of time, a lot of these companies that held everybody in-house, they're a lot of the ones that thrived coming out of it because they kept their tribe, they kept their team, they kept the culture, and boom, okay, boom, business is fully back up and running and we're rolling again. Mm -hmm. Well, then we get hit with COVID. And that was another one that we hit. And there are some companies that are like, we're going to try to hold the office together. Well, that was a little tough one to do. And everybody's being told you can't even go into the office. You have to stay home. So everybody kind of dabbled again. And a lot of people were forced to push into the stay at home, protect your family, do your business as you can, do the you know what you can. The challenge right now is that this whole mantra of work from home, like everything can be remote. Look at all the success that people are having with being remote. Big companies out there right now, not real estate, are realizing that, oh, crap, during COVID, we saw production go up because they couldn't do anything else. <laughs> all they could do is go like, I'm bored. I'm going to have a beer and I'm going to do some extra work tonight. Like, because <laughs> what else can I do? <laughs> like... That's what happened through COVID. And we're like, oh, production went up and all these areas, all these companies. And they were like, this is a model we've been missing. Well, now that everybody can go live their life again and everybody's coming back and we're like, oh, we have distracted people right now. We need to create a workforce and an environment for them. Places like Microsoft are like, come back. Amazon's like, come back. We need you back in the physical office again. And the real estate companies are going come back except you have a whole bunch of independent contractors right now and it's like you can't just go come back like they're just like can't tell me what to do i need to be fluid and out there and whatnot and <laughs> i'm not saying there's a right or wrong here i think there's a discipline that will allow you to be on your own running your own business and there's certain agents that are better than others at doing that for a lot of the realtor population realtor population a lot of them like they need that structure. They're going to thrive in that structure. They're going to thrive sitting next to Susie who just crushed it on a listing and coming in going like, oh, let me tell you about this amazing deal. These people I'm working with and the person next to them going like, well, if Susie's got a deal, I'm going to go get a deal. Like I'm going to go talk to people. I'm going to get out there. And they, they need that energy internally of the office. And where Matt and I are going to explore here a little bit is like, okay, so this is this timeline we've been on of kind of what's going on, what we've seen work, what we've seen not work, these satellite offices for the right people, I think it'd be great, Matt. There's a lot of the realtor population that I have watched and worked with over the years that they really do need that energy of the brick and mortar office and everybody coming together. And to lean too far one way, we're leaving out a lot of people. To leave too far the other way, we're leaving out a lot of people. And I think um, as we see these different brokerages. This is why I love our industry because I mean, I, I have like names of brokerages running through my head, but you all know them. There are ones that are really rigid coming to the office. This is where you do your business. We all come together, really powerful sales meetings that make people want to come to the office and everybody wants to be part of this whole. And there's other ones that have really successful models that are like, work from home. We have a great online platform. We have our home base over here, but you never need to come in. We have little places that we've you know, designed that you can work around town if you need to get to. And this is like, I don't like wearing Adidas. I like wearing Nikes. They're two different shoes. Like They work perfect. You can still run in them, but one fits one person, one fits the other. And I think it's like, know your business model, know who you're trying to attract, know what you need to provide for those agents to be successful because they're not the same. They're going to attract different people. If you have one model, don't try to get everybody. Try to get people that just fit your model. If you have this model over here, don't try to get every agent out there to be part of your brokerage. Bring in the ones that really fit for this model that you have. I'm on a rant, man. But this, <laughs> this, is, this is where like, I think I love this topic because I have watched this be this crazy thing that everybody thinks there's one answer for. And I don't think there is. And Larry, again, Larry and I've talked about this a lot, primarily 
2008 to 2011, I think we had a conversation almost monthly specifically about this. Well, and you're right that there's not one model that works best for for everyone. You know, although I think there are some cues that people can take away. And, and you know, if you're going to commit, like, if you're going to commit, you go all in. It's like EXP is an example. They've committed to the virtual brokerage, right? Committed. And they have committed to building the system that makes that work and attracts that type of agent that works in that. And so, like, you know what you're getting when you join a brokerage like that. I think there are a lot of brokerages, independents, franchises that are stuck in this in between trying to figure it out, which can probably be a little bit challenging on your operating expenses, right? You know, particularly if you're leasing square footage versus owning it outright. But, you know, a lot of the conversations I've had with agents, Garrett, recently, particularly as agents move from kind of, I'll say, a, a top performing level to wanting to go to the next and saying like they're they feel a bit alone they want to be surrounded by other top producers and you got to find the environment for that to happen and as a brokerage you have the opportunity to have that environment available to them can you do it through virtual sure i mean garrett we're sitting here across the country from each other literally almost as far apart as we can get with the exception of maybe one of us being in Maine and the other in Hawaii. But we're pretty darn far away. We run a virtual company essentially, right? I mean, we don't have a, a office where everybody comes to meet, but it works. We've, we've set up the environment for that. When it comes to sales agents, though, they are local. And I think if you listen to these agents who want to have that camaraderie, physical energy goes a whole long way too in terms of what it can do for your brokerage. It's, well, how do we set this up? And in the 20 teens, we saw the explosion of the communal workspaces, right? Like, oh, we're going to, co-working was becoming super popular until like, you know, they found out that the WeWork CEO was, you know, blowing all his money on other stuff. And they're like, ooh, that, that was bad. <laughs> but co communal workspaces and all that stuff have are still popular. In fact, I know a lot of real estate agents who rent space in these co-working spaces for themselves because they want an office space. And I think this highlights, okay, the real estate office went away from offices because like, hey, we can maximize square footage. We just make it super open. Everybody has a drop in place. Like, look at how it works in all these places. Yeah, if you're a software developer and you can put your headphones on and just sit there and tap away on the keys, fantastic. But if you want to be on phone calls, like real estate agents don't want to be in an open pit making phone calls where everybody else can hear them, right? I could never show up. If, that, if, that, if I walked in, and I'm not saying it's wrong. Again, for the right people, I get it. But if you had me coming into that environment, and you're like, we want Garrett Fry to be one of our associates here. Like, come in, check out our work environment. This is where you can come and do your work when you're here in the office. And I'm looking around at a room that's got a whole bunch of workspace and everybody's kind of in the same room. My ADD is going like, well, it's, it's not just that. Like, there's no work that's going to happen here for me. I mean, I think it's also the... When we make phone calls, it, it because we are independent contractors and we're running our own quote businesses, like we we want that sense of personal ability there and and sense of privacy. Because I always relate it to the trading desk. We're like, well, how do trading desks work? I mean, when I worked on a trading desk, I literally sat like two and a half feet. I mean, whatever was the appropriate like you know required distance for me to be away from the person next to me. Like we could touch elbows, right? Talking on the phone all day, yeah, easy because it was expected of the environment, right? And everybody who was on the other end of the phone knew that as well. So background noise was kind of like the thing, right? That's the feeling of being on a trading desk. But in a real estate office, it's it, you don't. I don't think you want your customers having that experience. Now, I do think that communal spaces, and maybe I get into the nit and gritty of this stuff because my wife is a commercial interior designer, so like she doesn't like designing office spaces. But this would be an area she would excel at in terms of like, well, you need to chop it up this way. But having that communal space is important, but giving people privacy is also important. And one thing that this is going to sound weird, Garrett, but the cubicle, the cubicle that, gosh, no one wants to be trapped in a cube. Neither do I. But you probably have enough privacy from something like that to be able to make phone calls if you want to have your own personal space where you can still have stuff there at the office you know, walk away from it without having to clean up a communal table. You know, I think that's the other thing. Even though we're digital a lot in real estate, 
we still have stuff. We still have want to have our handwritten notes ready. I mean, if you're also a brokerage, I should highlight this, Garrett. If you want to have a ninja-based brokerage, we need to have the ability for people to sit and write notes, the ability to sit and do their morning routine, their ability to sit and do their customer service calls, their hour of powers, preparing real estate reviews, printing them, doing mailing, and all of these things, which a big open table in the center of a room doesn't really afford the opportunity to do that because then you got to bring all your crap with you. And, and at that point, I'm like, I'm just staying at home. You brought up the little, the cubicles and the cubicles were great. They worked for a long time. And I mean, I, I worked in cubicles in real estate. I look back to when I was a kid and my dad's office that he built down in, uh, in Danville, California, like it was this massive, open, amazing building. And if you took all the cubicles out of it all the way around, like, it would be a very different open room, but like you have all these cubicles, there was 250 agents that worked and, you know, in this environment and in different ways, shapes or forms in this building. And it were, and there was private offices upstairs and stuff that, you know, but that environment you have to be able to have your space, be able to have your files, be able to have your stuff as well as being part of a bigger community. And I think that this is where, and this is where I was going mad up front. And I know we're kind of coming at this from two different areas, same kind of design, but is that we're almost separating it too much as what I'm watching and saying like, we're going to give you a place just to come and work where again, a lot of people, and I watch them, they feel disconnected from their office. Uh, they know that they have a place they can go work at, but they don't feel like they have a tribe. They don't feel like they have a team really anymore. They know they have a principal broker that they look up to and they like their principal broker. But there, there is this lacking element and it all kind of comes around with all this stuff. And you mentioned EXP. I know agents at EXP that flat out love it. Like they yeah. love it. They oh, yeah. love that sense. And there's agents that I know at Sotheby's that they're like, I would never want to do that. That's not my model. That's not who I am. Like I love having the structure of the office and the building and being able to come in and work there. And we could go back and forth at different offices. Those are the two big ones of kind of polar opposites that I think of in my head. And for most of them, it's going to attract the right people, but I'm going to encourage anybody who's running an office, whether it's these ones that you have these, these spaces, you got to find a way, one, to create the culture and the, and the energy for these agents in the right way. And then if you're going to make these environments for them to come work in, you got to be able to give them a space that they can come in and do work without having the distractions of other things. I love, as you said, Matt, a room with a big table that people can come into and sit down and like, make calls. And I, I don't think it works personally. I think we have a lot of ADD people. Like that's what is attracted into real estate. Yeah. <laughs> I'm one of them. Yeah. No, that's, that's very true. And I mean, listen, I, I will also say like, I understand that you're limited by the space you have. So I'm not, I'm not here to say brokerages need to go and make this massive investment today in all of this stuff. You got to work with what you have. And I think you can even make an open space flexible enough so that you can create those spaces within an open space, but convert it back to an open space somehow and have movable things that allow agents to still have stuff there. Like I, I was even thinking as you were talking, like what if you had, you know, an office that was designed for an agent to run a great ninja morning routine. So you kind of have this like more communal space. It's the handwriting station, you know, where people can come in. There's all these notes and everything all ready to go. And if you have your own notes, you can have your own spot to keep them there. And everybody comes in and you're sitting there and you're all writing notes together. Like, but it's quiet. You just kind of have that energy going. And then you can, you know, move to the phone call station where you have these little booths, phone booths where you can make your phone calls and whatnot. Imagine if you had a real estate review station, all your stuff yeah, there, so you can come in, station. create your real estate review, just here, just grab this, grab this, you got your stuff, bind it together, we got our binding system, you know, head out. But it would be so cool. It's an interesting concept. I like it. I don't know how you, how you create that, but I, there maybe is a way. And I think the whole point in us having this conversation is to hopefully inspire people to start thinking about, okay, how do we do this? Now, Garrett, beyond the physical too comes into how are you attracting agents in and, and the office meeting is not really good enough for one because it only happens at most once a week, which is a lot. 
by the way, because um, you have to think about, and Larry always says this, anytime you're requiring or asking your agents to be in the office, that is time you're taking them away from going and building their businesses. So it has to be super high value. So one, high value office meetings need to be a thing that where there is an in-person element that makes it valuable, right? Because I think a lot of brokers is leaving the virtual option, which is great, also is giving people the excuse not to show up, Right. Well, if I can just join in virtually, what's why do I need to go and drive down to the office? That's 30 minutes there. That's 30 minutes back. I got to get, you know, get ready uh, into like a different routine than I normally am because it's only once a week or twice a month. And, you know, I'm not just I don't want to interrupt, you know, that becomes three hours all of a sudden of that day just for that office meeting. It's a really good point when you're working remotely then to say, here, come in for this one meeting. It's all of a sudden like it's a heavy lift that turns into like going on a it's like going on a date. It's like oh, I got to like really get ready to show up and to like be in front of people and to like, oh, all right. Yeah. Oh, well, and and, you know, the industry is majority female and let's just face it. It's easier for guys to get ready. Right. And so your majority of the audience here coming into the office is female and there's more things that they do to get ready and it takes more time. And so you start to like, well, and not that people aren't getting ready for showings and things like that, of course, but it's a whole different routine then for the typical realtor, right. To, to show up at these office meetings, if it's just the office meeting. So this is where, what are the other things we can do to create the opportunity for agents to enjoy the space, whether it's what are the other things that agents go through that they could use support with, like just their regular routines. I mean, I, I heard of one office that so uh, I was I actually had the opportunity to to meet uh, a friend of mine who I've met through different venues, but we never met in person. Joel Diaz, who is the director of operations at Remax Real Estate in the Lehigh Valley in Pennsylvania. I went up and saw his office and they owned this building. And he said, yeah, when they, when they were going to build it, they were thinking about putting a gym in there, but they couldn't get it approved and they didn't have the space to do it. And like, he's like, then we would have the showers. Like it wouldn't be anything big, but if people can come in and like get a little workout, get showered and be able to get ready here. I was like, that would have been so cool. Now, unfortunately they just couldn't get it approved to get it, get it done. But the vision that he had, and now his office, they were going through this renovation there, but they had cubicles and then they have the center flexible space to use for meetings and all these things, which is really cool. They really thought about how people live in that office. And it, it's thinking like that, where it's what are the other things that we can do that's not just supporting the real estate, but also supporting the livelihood of our agents, right? And if you go down the road of like helping our agents be together to invest in real estate, and all these things that those are mechanisms that can pull people into the office. Now we're getting beyond maybe, well, it's kind of a combination of the physical office structure and the activities that actually pull people in. Well, you're going down the line of how do you create value that makes people want to step away from what they think is their time to go out and build their business and to come in. And I love the idea of like being able to have a section of it that's like wealth building, building their their future, their stuff. And that's like, I mean, I don't know. Maybe there is an office out there that that I'm sure there is that has that platform built into their company. Not a whole lot, though. I'll tell you that right now. No. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's funny. Carolina One actually launched a thing. It's totally digression. They launched this thing where agents and employees of the company could invest in property investments that the company was purchasing and opening up. Great idea. Um, anyway, total sidebar. No, I mean, there's some interesting platforms. You could create spaces for education. What if? What about just an education room where, hey, let's let's make sure our agents are trained up on not just on doing real estate, but also creating wealth for themselves. And I was thinking too, back to like when I worked in finance, I actually now look at this as kind of a con, but it was definitely a pro for the company. I was able to go to work in the morning, work out, eat my breakfast, work, eat lunch, work, and then eat dinner sometimes all in the same building. I never had to leave the building. Like talk about efficiency and the gym was good. The showers were great. The food quality was actually really, I would sometimes bring it home because the food quality was so good. Like talk about an environment to be a high, like a high performing person in like using your time at the best possible way you can. Like, yeah, that's pretty awesome. Oh man. The amount of hours that we can, now I look back and go, gosh, there's only so many hours of productivity we have. That's a lot of investment to keep somebody in one place for so long when then there's a lot of other breaks and things that happen. Although you provide some of that stuff 
and it changes. Now, I want to also bring up this one thing, Garrett. And I know we're just kind of like tacking on things here, but also the consumers. I think the one, the group of people that we sometimes forget about is when we set up offices is what's the experience for someone coming in? Do we have a lobby that gets consumers to want to come in and hang out? Like, how do we also hybrid our space maybe a little bit that depending on where you are, mm -hmm. Because if you're in like an office building thing, maybe that's not the thing. But if you're a main street storefront type of brokerage, like having a co-working space for people to come in and do their, you know, for the small business owners to just get away from their home office a little bit and, and have some experience there, that changes the energy of an office too that might get an agent to want to show up because they have the opportunity to network with their fellow community members. Yeah, it's interesting. I think we're moving away from it. I mean, I think our, our world is becoming a little bit more flexible around this as times kind of adjust. But uh, a lot of the studies that I've read and people that I've talked to and worked with in the past, one of the things that's come up a lot is uh, people like to know where they can find somebody, physically find somebody, a place that they reside and they're at, not their home. I'm saying like a place like an office that they go, I know if I want to find Matt Pinelli, like if worse comes to worse, if he's not answering my phone calls. Where is he? He's in that building right there. That's where he goes to every single day. And there is a comfort level of people when they're working with, you know, in like a real estate transaction or a high stakes situation to know that their person's kind of floating around up there and they don't really have a solid place and they're not really settled anywhere is not really, it doesn't bring on a whole lot of warm, fuzzy feelings of like, okay, I have a lot of trust in the situation that I'm in right now. I think in building a, um, a really strong referral based business to be able to not only refer and say, okay, this is, this is this agent that I really trust. This is the person that's helped me with my business and my real estate. This is where they work out of. They're at that office on this corner down here. That's where their brokerage is at, but here's their information. Here's this number. Here's her number and passing that information along. There is something about having that physical environment that is just a little bit I think it can help in building that long-term relationship, that referral-based business, having that physical space. Again, there's a lot of models out here that could prove me wrong right now. I, I can't. I keep hearing myself say something and going like, ah, "Yep, I know." But then there's this. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Maybe we're just old school, Garrett. I mean, I think it's old or just old. Um, I'm not old. No. Nope. You're not. No, I'm not, and I'm, and I never will be. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, I'm not going there. <laughs> But I think, you know, meeting clients, I think back to when I was listing and selling real estate, like I enjoyed inviting clients to the office and having a space for them to come and meet and sit down and for us to do business together. I understand that we have all these tech tools and things available to us that we don't need to do that. But I, I like the option. And this does get expensive if you're a brokerage because you're like, well, how many options are we going to have? And this is kind of contradicting how we started. But I think if you can develop a, a physical space, if you're going to go down this path, if you choose to say, hey, we are going to have a physical space and presence, I would look for the way that you can design it and use it to not just help your agents do good business, but to help them live a good routine and lifestyle and help their clients have a wonderful experience so that we want to pull everybody into that space. And But it's a choice, right? So we're not saying that's a must, but if you're going to lean that way, I think that's going to be a way to create an amazing result for the energy of your brokerage. Is that fair? No, totally fair. And Matt, to kind of pull around my old comment here for a second, I think the uh, the important way to look at what Matt and I are sharing or what I'm sharing. And this is the reason I went back to the beginning of time. We didn't go back that far. We went back to, you know, 2000, 2008. <laughs> we could go back further if you want. But in that going back that far, and the reason I go back to like, again, I grew up in a real estate office. I grew up running around watching business happen all day long. I grew up in the back of a CRS classroom and yeah, I have a lot of old stuff that I have brought with me over 45 years of literally, say, 40 of being around real estate. And I'm an observer and I'm also a questioner. And so even though being young, I'm always trying to figure out why. Why does that work that way? Why do we do it that way? What is the benefits of that? I've seen lots of different models over many, 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 many years. I've seen lots of marketplaces that I've watched different brokerages thrive and die in. And we have a lot of younger brokerages in the last 10 years 
Uh, we have a lot of younger, you know, newer agents and realtors in the last 10 years that haven't seen some marketplaces that we've gone through. And you can see it happen when everybody goes, oh my gosh, this is happening. How are we going to survive as realtors? And I'm like, calm down. It can't be any worse than the banks failing. You guys never saw that. You know, a lot of you never saw that happen. You didn't have to do a business during that. And we watched these changes in models. And the reason I'm sharing that is, is that when I said old, I think the best word is like, I've been through some seasons in this business, which is where the term <laughs> season comes from. I've seen some different things. And I think that sometimes when you haven't looked back at all the stuff in the past and you're just looking at your model right now, we can do knee-jerk stuff and swing a pendulum way to the other side going, nope, this is the wave of the future. Boom. And we're way over here. And everybody goes, how do we try to be that model? People who have the kind of old school platform struggle trying to make this new thing that we're trying to keep up with all the new stuff and who's doing what. Now, how do we compete with that when they're offering all these things? And this is where I go back to know your model, know your people, know who your agents are, know who the people are that you want to represent. There's all these different platforms out here, and some of them are, are going to thrive with that meeting room that everybody can come in and, and they can have their space to work. And the rest of the time they can run around and do all their own stuff. Some models need a place for people to come in and feel like they have a place of purpose and a bigger business that they're working with. And they look at their managing broker as their employer. And this is who I work for. And if you ask them, who do you work for? They don't sit there and go, me, I'm an independent contractor. I work by myself. They go, oh, I work for this company. I work here. This is my, my bigger bigger model. Mm -hmm. There are the right places for all these people. So you, I think as a brokerage, you first really need to know who you are, who you're trying to attract in, what the benefit is to those agents. How do we bring value to them? And same thing if you want to go the other route. It's the same thing. Know your people. Both are going to work. It's the ones that aren't clear and don't know where they're going. That's where I find it getting weird. They're trying to compete with somebody else and not realizing that's not our client. Yeah, It's like Honda trying to go, and, how do we get more of these Ferrari buyers to come in the doors and buy our Hondas? It's like, <laughs> not your client. What I would like to throw out there, Garrett, is you know every, every time we have a, um, we do a show, we post it in our Facebook group. And so I want to throw it out to everybody. You know, let's, let's pull the audience here. I want like in the comments on this episode, Go in and, and like share just like your wave your magic wand, what you want to see in an office structure, you know, or just and, and you don't have to write everything, maybe just a few things. And if you're a broker owner listening to this or a manager, uh, a couple of things that you would like to see or, or just ideas you have. We can pool some of this stuff together, use this incredible knowledge base that exists out there. We can start to see, OK, well, what do a lot of ninjas out there look for in an office structure? And. And maybe that'll help the broker owners and managers design their office spaces. And, and maybe we can pull some stuff from that and kind of like create some ideas around those things and whatnot. I think that would be fun, Garrett, to just kind of like, hey, here's our ideas. Now let's hear it from you. We want to hear your ideas too. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, I, I look back at like my own personal world, who I am. I like having camaraderie. I like having a team. I like, and it's hard. Like in the business that we have, Matt, that I own, it's like, I've done my best to build team structure with people all over the United States, which has been a fascinating thing trying to pull together and make sure that we're all one team culture running together. But when we're together in person, there's a whole nother energy when we have the opportunity to do it. And I know you're like, gosh, if we, if there was a way to create an, a ninja coaching office, it would happen. I mean, we've talked about that for just the podcast. How cool would it be if we had a studio where just you and I could be in there in person that would be amazing. And someday maybe we will. But this is this is obviously working out pretty well so far, um, the way we're doing it here. So <laughs> But it's the it's the pulling everybody together. And I think that's where I like so like for me, it's like I know I need that. At the same time, I work with people that they thrive by having their own place and not getting caught up in the office politics and just being able to just to thrive and grow in this little office that they rent downtown. So I don't think there is a right or a wrong answer. And no, I'm very curious, Matt, as you said, is like, you know, let's see what people's thoughts are around this. I encourage everybody to throw their two cents in around what we've shared today, because for the right people, there's the right places. So definitely. Matt, are you good? Or do you I'm good. I feel like we've like, no, I think, I think that's great. I mean, 
there's obviously more ideas we could talk about, but I think that's just creating <laughs> extra yeah. noise on this. I think we, we've hit the high points. We've hit the important things in, in here. So let's outro this thing. <laughs> Matt, great topic today. I appreciate you bringing this one to the table. This has been something that always weighs on my mind as I'm watching the world change and our businesses grow. And I just want to say great, great to kind of discuss this with you. To everybody who's listening, thank you so much. We appreciate you tuning in as always. If you want to know more about where this all comes out of, go to ninjaselling.com. If you want to learn more about Matt and myself, uh, you can find us on Facebook. You can find us on the community, uh, the Ninja Selling Podcast community on Facebook. You can go search that. That is a fast growing group. I, Matt says it's the fastest growing in the world. world. We're close. Universe. I think we're like a close second. Galaxy. Yeah. I don't know. We're, we're pretty much there. <laughs> and, uh, and again, I appreciate all of you who reach out to us and just say thank you. I've had so many great conversations with people recently where they have shared what the podcast means to them. And uh, that is really powerful to Matt and I. Matt and I always share that when somebody shares it with us. We kind of text each other, or tell each other kind of what's going on. And um that is why we do this. That is the biggest benefit that we get out of doing the podcast is knowing that it's helping everybody grow and be the best that they can possibly be. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate all of you. And I hope you have an amazing, amazing week. So thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Take care. If you enjoyed today's episode and would like more, visit us at the ninja selling podcast.com. There you will also find links for more information about ninja selling and coaching. Have an incredible day.